Okay, so today we will be uh, discussing some uh, tips and tricks in effective presentation skills. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure no one has given any presentations in the past four months, unless it was online. But hopefully we will be getting back to giving live presentations in the future and, and, uh, and, and part of the uh, skill set of, of a Meriti graduate is being able to present at conferences or uh, make presentations about uh, some parts of the, uh, about uh, uh, ethical issues and giving workshops. Uh, let me start by saying that it, I know that all of you uh, have done teaching before. Uh, I'm sure you all have a, a very strong uh, uh, skill set when it comes to giving presentations. So this is not going to be some a presentation where I start from scratch, from from nothing. It's uh, it's more of a sharing between the seven of us, uh, sharing our best practices in giving uh, presentations. Uh, we will also be discussing some uh, a few items that will be also uh, useful if you give uh, online presentations, like for example in in preparing of a of the sequence of your presentation or or um, uh, how you deliver. Uh, the, uh, the presentation. Uh, so this will also be useful um, in, in the current times when, we, uh, when, we, we, when we're not giving live presentations. So I assume that uh, all of you, you've given presentations before. Is that correct? Yes. Have you all me? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. So I'm, yes. I'm from the uh, right assumption that you are all actually uh, excellent presenters. Uh, and as Professor Henry always says, there is always room for improvement. So we're, we're just going to go over um, stuff that might be um, like, we'll go the extra mile where we talk about uh, challenges maybe and, and best practices. So this is the, the plan for today. We will be uh, discussing uh, planning effective presentations. Uh, one model that I, I am truly fond of is called the Monroe Motivated Sequence. Has any of you heard of it before? The Monroe Motivated Sequence? Great, so this will be an addition to your toolkit then. And then uh, we will also uh, utilize, uh, uh, discuss some attention hooks and, and training aids that you can use in, in presentations, uh, some of which can actually also be used in, in, in giving online presentations. So as with any activity that you, that you want to, to do, uh, the first thing you start with is planning and then execution and then evaluation. Uh, and as you evaluate your performance, you then become a, a, a you, you do a better job next time you're planning a presentation. So we'll be discussing these uh, three items. How do you plan a presentation? How do you deliver a presentation? And how do you evaluate your performance after giving a presentation, okay? So let me, uh, tell me about your uh, experiences. What do you do before a presentation? If you know you're having a presentation tomorrow, for example, uh, about any topic that you know very well, something in your speciality that you know, uh, what do you do in terms of planning a presentation? Give me your, um, your, your um, secrets. What are the secrets for your effective presentations? Mm -hmm. That's your target audience. Uh, could you repeat that, Dr. Sara? That's your target audience. Who's the, who's the, the audience? The okay. So you want to collect to know the, the audience. people I'm talking to. Okay, excellent. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? It seems I have a bad connection. Okay, we, we can hear you. So yes, definitely you collect information and, and uh, study your target audience. What is their level of knowledge? Uh, uh, how much do you know about the topic? What is their age? Uh, what is their experience in the field? And, and these are all important in preparing. What else? Prepare the deck I'm going to present. Okay, so you, you sort of uh, organize your ideas in, into a presentation. Uh, yeah, and get the most updated data. Okay, so you, first you collect the information and then you organize it. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Okay. I'm sorry, I had a, a 
a connection. Uh, I had my connection lost. I was told <laughs> that I should know uh, my audience. This is the first step. Yes, this is an excellent point. So uh, preparation is key. 90%, any presentation is about 80 to 90% preparation and 10% delivery. So if you fail to prepare, then you're preparing yourself to fail in, the, in this presentation. And, and this is also uh, a, a very tricky subject because sometimes when people are very good at giving presentations, uh, they rely on their skills and not do enough work in the preparing. Uh, like, for example, if you're giving a presentation for a, uh, for, 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 for example, for your students and the next year you're giving the same presentation for another group of students, sometimes you feel that, yes, I've given this presentation before, uh, I might not need to review it before that. But again, uh, what you need to remember always is that you are always preparing for a specific audience. You're always preparing for a specific audience, like Dr. Sara said, and that you always need to prepare for this specific audience. So if, you, if the audience change, if they are not the same people that were in this class last year, then you need to prepare for this audience, okay? So one of the metaphors that I always like to use in, in, in giving presentations is that a presentation is, is, is composed of two parts. You have the content, like Dr. Sarah, uh, Dr. Maha was talking about, the data that you want to deliver to your audience, the core of the presentation, the thing, uh, the knowledge that, uh, and the skills that you would like to discuss with your audience. So this is what we call the, the core or the content. And then in order to deliver this content to an adult audience, you need to package it. Okay? You need to put it in a package that will allow the audience to, uh, to, to, to benefit from it. Okay, so sometimes we have all attended sessions for people who are, uh, who have excellent content. Okay, they are experts in their fields, but because they lack the, the skills of packaging, the audience does not benefit enough. Can, can you relate to this experience? Do you know, uh, an do you have you passed through an experience that has this? Someone who's very good in, 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 in their background knowledge and their knowledge about the topic, but they are very poor in delivering their presentations. H have you had this experience before? Yes. Yes. yes, of course, yeah. Okay, so, and usually what happens is we are so uh, uh, focused on preparing of the content that usually we do not pay enough attention to the preparation of the packaging, okay? And as you see in, in, in this metaphor here, the, I, the packaging is actually- I think, I think most of us, can I think at something? I think most of us ha had this problem uh, uh, at first. Uh, yeah. it, it's the, uh, of course different uh, uh, now from the first presentation I gave in my life. It's 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 different now. Yeah, it's experience. It's something to be learned. Yes, exactly. And and uh, like you say, when when people are inexperienced in the giving presentation, they think that the audience are going to be evaluating their content only. And so they don't pay enough attention to how they package their content. Okay? And, and, and there is always uh, this uh, uh, analogy of, uh, of giving someone, for example, if you have a, a friend and you, you would like to give them a, a, a present, you could give them uh, something that is uh, really very simple, like a flower, but you can add the uh, cellophane and some glitter and, 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 and you will make it look very nice and they will accept it happily. Uh, you can get something that's really very expensive, like a diamond ring. Uh, but if you don't package it well, it might not be well received. So if you get a, a diamond ring and you put it in a, in, a, in a garbage bag, in a black garbage bag, and, and you say, here you go, then the participant or, or whoever you're giving the present is not going to feel very appreciated. Despite the fact that the content of the present is very uh, valuable, but because your packaging was not well thought of, the, the, this package, the, the, the whole uh, presentation will not be well received by your participants. So when you prepare a presentation, you prepare the content and you also prepare the packaging. We will also be discussing uh, uh, how do we do this packaging of a presentation. So the first thing in planning, obviously, is setting your objectives. In, in any presentation, you should have an objective, an objective that relates to your specific audience, like Dr. Sara said. 
So you prepare for this specific audience, you know, you, who is going to be present, what is their age, uh, uh, what is their background on the topic, uh, collect as much information as you can about your audience. This will help you prepare uh, better for this specific audience. You also need to put yourself in the shoes of the audience as you prepare your presentation. As you're planning a presentation, you shift between your position as an instructor for them and the position of someone receiving this. So you're constantly making this in your mind, putting yourself in the shoes of, the, of whoever is going to be listening, the audience who will be listening to your presentation and deciding, is this simple enough? Is this complex enough? Is this uh, challenging enough? Is this clear enough? And as you ask that, you make uh, uh, modifications by putting yourself in the shoes of, of, of the learners, okay? So you have to, to, uh, to put in your mind that sometimes uh, that, you will, that you prepare this presentation according to the expectations of whoever is, is going to be listening, your audience. Then, as, as Dr. Ma said, you prepare the content of, of uh, your presentation and the materials. It is also uh, uh, important that you know where you will be giving this presentation. Okay? Sometimes if you're invited uh, to a, a conference, maybe, and uh, maybe you feel, uh, you, you sort of think that naturally there is going to be a podium. You know what a podium is? It's a, a bench that you stand behind. And some people find it relieving that, that, that there is a sort of a, a barrier between you and the people and, and sort of reduces your stress. And as you prepare your presentation, you, you are relaxed because of the idea that there's going to be a podium. And then you go to the conference and you realize, no, it's a stage. You're giving the presentation on a stage with no podium. So you, you, as much as you can try to know the, the, the whereabouts of the, of the place you'll be giving the presentation, how much space you will be having to move around in, okay? This is important. Uh, how many are going to be uh, attending? How, also, how are they going to be seated? How are the audience going to be seated? If you're preparing some active learning techniques where you want people to do small group discussions, you need people to be seated in, an, in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a manner that allows them to, 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 to communicate with each other. So it's sort of a theater like, okay, when the seats are, are uh, pinned to the ground and they are all in one line, it's, it's quite difficult to do a group exercise. You can do group exercise, but it's going to be difficult for people to be discussing uh, also the, the size of the group, how, how many you'll be teaching or how many you'll be giving the presentation to. So uh, large numbers, you have to think of, uh, of packaging ideas that are going to be different if you have like five or six participants, okay? So you collect as much data as you can about the audience, about the location. Do they have a microphone? Do, you ha do they have a sound system? Do you know about yourself that you have a, a, a low voice? Then maybe if you uh, will be giving presentations, you could buy your own microphone because sometimes you'll go to places that will not have a microphone. So you, you try to adjust as much as you can to the best of your ability, to the audience, to the location, and to the uh, materials and capabilities this place has. So first you decide on your objectives. You uh, study the audience, you know, uh, you know, as you collect data as much as you can about the audience, about the location, then you build a, your presentation. Now this is really uh, very simple. Usually what we do is, is we divide any presentation into an intro, then the body of the presentation, then the finale or, or the, the, the thing that you end the presentation with. So uh, can you use your uh, annotations? I would like each of you to mark uh, the, the part of the presentation, whether intro body or finale that you think is the most important part of a presentation. So this is a question, what is the most important part when you're giving a presentation? Is it the intro, the body, or the finale? I know they are all important, but if, the, if you have something that is really unique, if you have sort of a, a, a metaphor or, or maybe a quote that is very unique, would you put it in the intro or the body or the finale? So we were trying to make uh, a distinction. I know they are all important. Just let me know what you think. So we have a lot of uh, people uh, deciding that the intro, okay. The, the finale is the most important part for the presenter. Yes. <laughs> a 
<laughs> okay. So um, is the same person uh, using the, the white green line marking the intro and the finale? Or is it a different person? Have you, uh, is there someone who has changed their mind or is it a different person? No, no, it's, no, it's me just having green. I don't know who is the other one. Okay. Okay, so, so we, we, we have a lot of people deciding that the intro is the most important part uh, and only one person who is uh, selling against the, the tide, so it's uh, deciding the finale. Uh, I don't know if there is a scientific uh, uh, solution to this question, but if I had to choose, I would uh, choose the finale. So I have one soulmate among the group. Who is that? Who chose the finale? I chose intro and finale with, with a big highlighter, green highlighter. Oh, you're only supposed to pick one. <laughs> ah, okay. You're because you're because, <laughs> because Dr. Oh, Maha no, said... There was two greens. <laughs> <laughs> no, because, because Dr. Maha said, if you have an important quote, where do you want to put it? I thought an important quote... We will say it when we want to give presentation in the beginning of our uh, presentation and then to emphasize it as a uh, take home note, like in the, uh, in the conclusion and wrapping up. That's why I thought we say the important quote both in introduction and at the end. Yeah, I'm glad you chose the finale because then I would have been all alone choosing the finale myself. So uh, as we go through the, the Monroe motivated sequence, uh, we will know uh, uh, how important giving some, the people something to do at the end. So for me, the answer to this question, if I have something that is really profound in its effect, I think it has a profound effect on the learner or on the audience, I will keep it to the end because uh, the end, is, as, as Golana just said, it's, it's what you take home from a presentation. And that is why we need in building our presentation to put some emphasis on the finale. But I, always, I also accept that uh, those who chose the intro because it's also very important. It's the time when the audience decides, uh, makes this big decision, whether I'm going to be listening to this presentation or am I going to take out my cell phone and, and text and, uh, and chat with, with, with some of my uh, colleagues or whatever, okay? So the intro, maybe the first minute or two, is when the, when the audience decides, is this presentation worth listening to? Am I going to give this presenter my time and attention? Or am I going to give them only part of my attention and but also I do some work as I listen to it? Am I going to be giving them nothing, none of my attention? I'm just going to give them uh, uh, just my body sitting there and, and, and then when they say, okay, thank you, I will leave without taking anything. Okay, so also some emphasis is important in the intro because it is when the audience decides that they will be listening to this presentation, that this is something that is worth spending my time and concentration on. Okay, of course, the body is important too. This is the content of, of, of your presentation. Okay, but it is based on what you do on the intro. Okay, people will carry over to the body with what you have given them as an intro. Okay, so let me uh, ask you, what do you usually do in the beginning of a presentation? What is your best practice for starting a presentation? I think uh, we introduce ourselves Excellent. Okay. and saying what we are going to talk about. And mm -hmm. like, like an introduction, like in writing, we say what we want to talk and um, different sections and um, what we want to conclude. So you preview the, like the, the, the map of, of your presentation, the, what, how you're going to move around the topic? Yes. Okay, excellent. So introduce yourself and preview your content. What else? Other thoughts from anyone? Yes. A question or quiz? You can use a question or quiz. Yes, this is uh, what we call an attention hook. We can use that also in the beginning of a presentation. Uh, what hey, else? What, um, what do you, uh, Tell me more about that. A question or a quiz? Uh, do, you, do you want to scare your audience with the quiz? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not scaring them, but it's, it's kind to get them motivated and 
and I can get benefit from from this in many ways. I will uh, I can motivate them so that they will uh, if they don't know the answer they will uh, become attentive and uh, will follow the lecture or what kind of presentation. And in on the other side, I can by this quiz assess their knowledge so that I, I can adjust my presentation according to, 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 their, to their response. Just, and just like then, that, you're going to um, 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 change your presentation just, just on the basis uh, of, of no, not, questions. No, not, not, not change the presentation, but I can stress on some parts. I see. I see. And, um, well, I, I, I mean, those are good thoughts. Um, I'm not sure if you're going to do a rapid statistical analysis of the responses um, so that you would change your or emphasize more points than, than another. Um, uh, but um, uh, I, I do like the idea of asking a question, uh, not so much a quiz, uh, uh, but I, I uh, in the beginning, I like to ask a very simple question. Um, and, uh, you know, it could be like, how many people have heard of this? Or something like that. You know, nothing about the subject matter or, uh, well, something about the subject matter, but not, not very inquisitive. And I do that for several reasons. One, I, I want to um, immediately engage with the audience, okay? Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, just to make contact. Uh, that's why uh, in trying to replicate this a uh, face-to-face -face teaching, this is why I ask everyone to put on their videos. It's not because I enjoy looking at your faces, uh, but actually I do, okay? This is how I get to connect with you. If I could see your faces, your smiles, okay? Uh, actually, I like this better than and what's happening here because you guys are not uh, wearing any any masks because of the um, coronavirus. So this is the first time I'm actually seeing people's faces throughout the day. Right? <laughs> so I actually, uh, no, seriously, I, 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 I need to connect. And that's why I asked you to put on your videos. Now, with the audience, I like to just a simple question. It could be how many how many people thought about this this morning? You know, raise your hand, and that starts to move the audience. Um, also, uh, most importantly, if you ask a question and they raise a hand, blah blah blah, it gives you time to settle down. In, in the beginning of the presentation, that's when you are the most nervous. Okay, the finale, it's like, oh God, it's over, okay? But it gives you a chance to settle down if you ask a question in the beginning. I, I, I don't know, Maha, uh, I'm sure you probably were gonna go over all of this, but um, I, I thought I would take this opportunity since, uh, science uh, about asking a question which i think it's a good idea having said that i um i had told that to uh, a previous group of trainees and uh she was giving a talk about um intravenous drug abuse and and her question was how how many people have have done intravenous drug abuse. <laughs> I said, that's not the question I want to ask. That's at the end of your presentation. 
<laughs> right, that's right. Uh, fortunately, nobody raised their hands. Okay. All right, good. I'm sorry, Maha. No, no, uh, that, uh, that's uh, actually uh, exactly what I was going to say when we were discussing the questions. There are um, questions, the very good way of starting a presentation because it's, it breaks the ice. It gets the audience to speak. And uh, when you're nervous and, and you hear the audience speaking, you, then you realize, oh, they're just human. So then the level of tension sort of, sort of decreases because when you start a presentation, everyone is trying to decide, as we said, whether they are going to be listening or not. So they are looking at you very attentively and this can be alarming to some people. Uh, the, the very beginning of a presentation when, when everyone is just looking at you and as you ask a question people start to look inside their minds so they sort of they shift their attention to themselves and then you have time like Dr. Henry said to take a breath and as they think of the answers to your question or as they respond you, you start to feel accepted among the audience and, and that is when you start to relax and, and move on to the next. Also as, as, as Professor Henry said there are two types of questions. There are smart questions and there are other questions, okay? So we want usually to speak with smart questions. You want the question to be uh, a, a little bit uh, challenging, but also not offensive, okay? So you don't want to judge the audience. So you don't ask, for example, uh, the participants, who here has never done exercise in their whole lives? and ask people to raise their hand. This is something negative. You don't want to throw at the audience anything that is negative because they will feel you are judging them. You are giving presentation to others and, and they like to feel respected. And, and this is sort of how things should go, that, that they should feel respected. And, and, and that is why you should think very thoroughly of what question you will be asking at the beginning. You want something that is witty, smart, and something that at the same time is not offensive or personal or private something that allows them to have some thoughts. Like for example, yesterday when, uh, or the day before that, when I started giving the presentation, I asked how many of you has been involved in, the, in, in obtaining an informed consent? So it's something that's relevant to the topic I was going to be discussing. It has nothing offensive in it. And it allowed me to know more about the audience like Dr. Said was saying, it allowed me to know uh, how many of you have already had experience with doing an informed consent. Okay, so if you start with a question, ask yourself, is this a smart question or is it the other type of question? If, if, it, if you think it's the other type, then you need to, you need only smart questions in the intro. Oh, I need to remove the uh, annotations. Okay, so the first thing you need to do as you start the presentation is to answer this question on the screen. What's in it for me? With them, it's a, it has a, an acronym that's called with them. What's in it for me? So the audience usually are going to be adults. If, if you're going to teach research ethics or, or whatever topic, or even giving a conference presentation, you have adults. And adults have a, a, the notion of, of having their time being very precious. So they will only invest their time in a presentation if they know there is going to be a revenue. This is also why, one reason why, we, why it is, is, is very smart to start with a question, because if, if most of the people think this question is intriguing and think that you are going to answer this question in the presentation, they are going to be attentive, okay? So in the beginning of a presentation, they have their antennas up. What's in it for me? This is the question that you need to answer in the very beginning of your presentation. What is, it, uh, is, it go what is this presentation going to give your audience, okay? Uh, some ways uh, of, of starting a presentation are going to be questions. I don't know the, uh, I can't find my mouse. Hmm. Okay. Oh, um, you have to, um, um, on one side of the bar. Yeah. Yes. I found, found it. Yes, I yes, found okay. it. Okay, so, so like Dr. Uh, Golana said, you, you first start by introducing yourself. And uh, I know this is very simple, but it can also be tricky. What do you say about yourself? Okay, so my tip for doing that is, for example, 
Now you are sitting in, in place of my audience. First thing you need to do is to stand at a distance that allows you, can, can you hear me well now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. yes. You don't stand very far off from your audience, okay? Because that's what you tend to do when you're scared. Take yourself back because you feel threatened. You have to go, to go counterintuitive. You have to move ahead. And you also don't need to go very close to your audience so they, fe so they feel threatened, okay? So you stand somewhere in the middle, okay? About uh, uh, one and a half meter from the first person or the first row. And you stand in, in the middle of, uh, uh, of the rows or of the lines, okay? So you can uh, actually, with your, uh, with, with your um, uh, uh, eye contact, cover the whole, the, 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 the whole lot of people. Okay. Sometimes when you're giving presentations and uh, uh, the audience has some people you know, you will find yourself also tend to go towards them. On my right here are people, some of my friends or my colleagues, and, and they're supportive, they're smiling at me and, and, and encouraging me. I will have a tendency to move towards their side. And then the people on, the, on my left here are going to feel left out a little bit. Okay. So you need to, to do this very consciously, standing not very far off, and not very close so that people feel threatened, somewhere in, in the middle where you can, where you, there's a, 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 about a one and a half or two meters between, between you and the first line. And then you introduce yourself by doing uh, uh, what we call a, a, a panoramic look, okay? So you go from the far left or the far right and you go, hello everyone, my name is Mahayma, okay? So hello everyone, you need to greet everyone. Eye contact is very important in, in the beginning. It establishes trust. It tells your audience that you're not scared, that you have prepared very well, that you are greeting them, okay? So you give the whole audience one look in, in, with a sort of a panoramic look like this, and then you introduce yourself. As you introduce yourself, you say the things about you that are relevant to, to this audience, okay? So you don't say that you have been to Europe and that you have had a, a PhD from Oxford. And no, if, if this is about research ethics, you say your credentials where it relates to research ethics, your job and your credentials where it relates to research ethics. If you're giving a presentation about your, uh, your own uh, research, for example, then you state your credentials that, uh, that makes you uh, um, um, worthy in this. Okay. So this is one way of telling the audience that you know what you, with that, what you will be speaking about, okay? So you don't start with what we call the, the star performance, okay? The star performance starts with a very long uh, presentation about himself or about herself, where he has gone, what he has done in the past summer, uh, where he has done snorkeling in Hergada and, and gives you an, uh, 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 tells you the story of, of his or her life. With, when, when it is not relevant at all. So what you do is you give the credentials that make you worthy of giving this specific presentation. Okay, does this make sense? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you, you sometimes even you need to revise your introductory slide and state on it the credentials that make you the best person to give this presentation. Okay, then you utilize what we call an attention hook. Okay, we will be discussing this very shortly. What else? The, the next thing you need to do as an answer to what's in it for me is to establish relevance. What we mean is that the people think their time is very precious. How is this presentation relevant to their life or, the, or their work? And this is when questions are very important, okay? So if, for example, you're giving a, a, a presentation, for example, about neonatal resuscitation, to a group of nurses. And maybe what you need to do to establish relevance is to ask them questions about their practice that you know is challenging. How many of you have been put in a situation where they do so-and-so? How many have, uh, have had problems with so-and-so? So you establish the, the relevance between what you will be saying in this session room to their life outside the session room. Okay, if I'm giving a presentation about informed consent, I will ask the people, uh, because I know all of you, for example, are researchers. So I'm going to ask questions that will establish the relevance of what I'm going to say to your practice. You will be doing research in the future. How do you write the informed consent for that then? Okay, so this is establishing the relevance, telling people what they will take out of this presentation. 
okay? This is the uh, literal answer of what is in it for me. What is in it for me in this presentation, I'm going to give you the tools to write an, a, a, an excellent informed consent. I will be giving you the tools to do a, a risk benefit assessment for a proposal that you will be reviewing. I will be giving you the tools for, uh, uh, for example, uh, hand washing, if, if, you're going, if you're giving skills or, or proper uh, uh, wearing of a mask. So we establish, establish the relevance between what you are going to say and the personal and uh, occupational life of those who are listening to this presentation. Uh, usually, so some, presenter, some presenters choose to collect expectations. I usually don't find that very uh, useful. I, I'm, it, it's just my personal experience. I don't find collecting uh, expectations very useful because sometimes people don't have expectations and they will have to think of expectations as, as, as right now, as you're saying. So sometimes you don't know what to expect. So I usually don't ask that question literally. But I will do my research before the presentation to know with the level of knowledge of this audience what they should expect. Like I was saying, you put yourself in the shoes of the presenters and then back in the shoes of, uh, or in the audience and then back in the shoes of the presenter so that you know uh, what, they, what kind of questions are going to come to their mind, what kind of knowledge they will be wanting to learn, what kind of skills they will be wanting to take out of this presentation. Okay. Uh, sorry, can I add something? Yes, please. Yes, uh, we, one useful way is to collect the expectations before the presentation itself. Okay, uh, you mean if online for, or uh, in a form or, uh, or during registration, something like yes, that? Yes, something like this, yeah. Okay, yes, the, I, I would agree, yes. But I, I find it um, because the, the, some, some training schools, specifically in Egypt, they necessitate that everyone states their expectations and some people are not very comfortable speaking in the beginning of a presentation. Okay? And, and I respect that. I respect that some people are not willing to, to speak up uh, at the beginning. I, I will nudge them later on to speak, but as the presentation is starting, I don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable. Okay? You want to create a safe environment where it is possible for you to present your material and possible for the participants to, uh, to gain knowledge and skills from this presentation. So if you're nervous, if you're afraid, if, you're, uh, if you think you're disrespected, these are not things that are, uh, are, uh, are going to make you uh, 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 learn anything, okay? They will make you wait until the, end, the last minute and then leave and never come back to, the, to a presentation like this one. Okay. Yeah, I have to add something too. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, so uh, I know it's, it's talking about the presentation only, but if I'm going to like an undergrad students and it's my first time for them to give them a course or something, uh, I like to start with a pre-assessment test. And uh, the pre-assessment test uh, give me the time to settle in, like you guys said, uh, but in the same time, I can, I can have a post-assessment test by the end of the course so I, I can understand uh, what happens and I can calculate statistically uh, how much knowledge and information the student gain from the from the course. Uh, another thing I usually uh, after the pre-assessment um, I give them like uh, cards, colored cards and we should like it's like raising hands or something like that but I give them a question and uh, with like yellow and red or green and blue cards and that's get them really excited to pay attention to me before I start the lecture. So I really got them where I want before I start. But the finale, I'm not sure about it. So. <laughs> I will be discussing the finale as well. Uh, what, also, one word about a pretests. In an undergraduate uh, uh, setting, this is acceptable because they know they will be tested. However, adults usually don't like tests, usually. They don't like being tested, but but we we sometimes we do pretests. We have to sometimes, and sometimes we would like to do pretests. So what is important when doing a pretest is what you do in framing the pretest, in saying that this test has nothing to do with uh, evaluating you at all. It's for evaluating the program. It's not about you. It's about me. It's about my teaching. It's it's an evaluation of myself, not an evaluation of you. It says nothing about you. You don't need to write your names on the evaluation sheets or on the pretests. Uh, it is okay to, to not know any answers at all. This is what we call the framing, okay? So you don't just give them a test and say, please answer that. 
because the word test has a very negative energy. So what you do is you frame whatever activity you think might be uncomfortable. The framing here is saying this has nothing to do with you. This is an evaluation of the program. Uh, if you don't know the answer, that is very fine. We want people to be not knowledgeable in the pretest. Actually, that's uh, that's what we want. And uh, it is all. It's only for my evaluation. You don't need to write to na your name. No one will ever know your paper from the paper of someone else. Okay. And when you make this framing, it becomes a, a lot uh, easier. And then you would need to do some ice break afterwards, maybe by using the flashcards, like we said, giving the, uh, the, the participants some flashcards in order to, uh, to use during the presentation. Okay. So what can we use as attention hooks? We said that uh, in an intro, you use attention hooks. An attention hook is something that you use When you feel that at the beginning or when you feel that your audience is uh, becoming, uh, have lost their interest or are getting tired. So one we said before was questions. Okay, you can use them in the beginning. You can use them whenever you find your audience starting to feel tired or to lose interest. You can use questions because as we said, they have a lot of um, uh, advantages. What else other than questions do you use as attention hooks? Anything else? And maybe a game or a, a video. I can use a, a video in the beginning of the presentation. Yes, people like, we love when you play videos in presentations. Uh, uh, you, you said also something else. What else other than videos? Games. Yes. Games. Oh, yeah. uh, excellent. And, and gamification of learning is, is, a, is a huge domain in, in learning now. Okay, what else? To change the subject, uh, to, to, to say something uh, small story, uh, short story, or anything uh, to change, to, to make them uh, uh, more attracted. Yes, people love being told stories, and we will have also a discussion about metaphors, what we mean by metaphors in learning. Uh, Excuse so me. Dr. Maher, uh, I got disconnected and I joined the, uh, the meeting again. Uh, I just uh, have a question about the suggestion that uh, Dr. El Said had about uh, uh, asking about expectations like, uh, like a questionnaire or in the beginning before having the presentation. Uh, it's a very good idea, but I want to know how we can do it in like in a conference or in a seminar when we have, you know, a dedicated time, like it's five of us and we have each half an hour to talk. Do we have to put like a questionnaire like two days before, like spread out or send an email to our audience or uh, I don't know, before the meeting or I don't know how, how this is possible or it's a good idea also for our own presentations like we have prepared a presentation each speaking for five minutes for this Merity course and this is also good to practice it but I don't know how in advance you have to prepare to ask for expectations of the audience. Okay, so let me answer first by saying that uh, what I intend to do during this presentation is to explore your uh, skill set. So each of you has sort of a, uh, of a, a let's say, uh, uh, you know, archery. It's a sport. Okay, it's when you have an arrow and you point and okay. So the, in, in archery, you have a, a the, this thing that you keep where you keep your arrows. So during every presentation, you have, I can't remember its name, but you know, <laughs> you have this uh, arrow case, okay? And you have a lot of arrows in there. So you don't use all of your arrows every time. Every time you make a conscious choice of, yes, this presentation requires this arrow and you aim and you, and you, and you, and you, you target. If it hits the target, good and well if it doesn't hit the target then you still have other arrows you can use okay so you don't have to use a pre-test or a questionnaire before every presentation 
maybe it's, it would not be that uh, a, a good idea in a conference, but uh, if you have a workshop, you can send via the email, like you said, if you have questions to participants, collecting expectations before that, if you have the emails, that would be a good idea. In, uh, in conferences, if, if like you say, you have, you, you, everyone is having half an hour, you can use polling. Polling, I, uh, I'm not sure you have had experience with that on the Zoom, but it's when uh, you ask people with a, with a smartphone to log into an app, and in the app, the presenter sends the, the, the question, everyone chooses an answer, and then he displays or she displays on the screen how many how said many? had experience uh, with something like that. I've, yeah, I've seen it. This, uh, this is available also, also on Zoom, the polling. It's on Zoom, and I've, and I've had experiences with it in conferences, even live conferences, and it takes very little time. And you, you do exactly, you do it with the same aim. You collect uh, what people think of, about something uh, or even their knowledge about uh, a specific topic. So it could be a question like a quiz, okay? So yes. uh, in attention hooks, uh, we, we've, uh, you said questions, you said stories, uh, you said games. Uh, um, let me see what I have here. So we have questions. We also have metaphors. Metaphor is a, is a sort of a fancy name for the word for stories, okay? But uh, metaphor is, is a story that has a, a learning point. So you're not telling them a story about when about vacation, for example. You are telling them a story that has a learning point, and this learning point is relevant to what uh, they will be learning. Okay? Discussing this more. Also, you can use quotes. These are good attention hooks because. Uh, you can use them in the beginning of, of your presentation. So these are also uh, good attention books. And the best of all, actually, is humor. When you say something that will make your audience uh, smile or laugh, okay? Because uh, it says that people learn faster when they are enjoying themselves, okay? I think we all have this experience. If we're enjoying ourselves, then we tend to uh, not feel the flow of time. So, and when we are enjoying ourselves, we are more prone to... Someone has their microphone on. We could... Uh... Okay, so humor is something that you prepare for before a presentation. It's part of your packaging of, of, uh, of your, uh, your presentation of, of your content. So we need to think what quotes I, I will be using, what question could I ask? All of this is part of your preparation. All of this is part of you preparing your presentation. Even the jokes you will be saying, some of course are going to come at the moment and, 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 and that's just fine. But if there is something that you know, that you know when you will be giving the presentation that's going to make your audience smile or laugh, you can prepare for it as well. Now we come to this uh, model called Monroe Motivated Sequence. Now this uh, scientist Monroe, uh, he, has, he, he made this model where he says that there are five steps of, uh, of, during giving a presentation that should be covered. So your presentation should flow with the flow of the thinking of your audience. So these five steps are, you begin with attracting the attention of the audience, like we said, by using an attention hook. So you ask some questions, maybe you tell a metaphor or a story, uh, you, you discuss with them a quote, or uh, some, some people will, um, will show in their presentation a, a comic, like um, a, a, a funny comic, and ask people to uh, reflect on it. So you start with attracting the attention of the audience, and then what you do is you uh, uh, have them I'll tell them the need that they, why they need to be listening to this presentation, okay? So you state the problem, you descri describe the problem. This is also what, what happens when you ask a question, because some people, as Dr. Said said, will not know the answer to this question, okay? So if you, or, or you create the need by asking, by uh, uh, connecting with the needs of the audience that you know are there. How many of you have had problems with writing informed consent? How many of you uh, were not uh, sure when they um, uh, applied for an REC? Uh, ha how many of you know what are the levels of review? Uh, ha have, have any of you done a risk benefit assessment before? So when you ask these questions, okay, which uh, as we said are, are, are very uh, mild questions, they are not offensive in any way, 
but then you create the needs. You, you, you have people thinking, oh, I don't know that. Is he going to say that in the presentation? Oh, that's a good thing. I'm going to listen because I want to know the, the answer to this question. Okay. So the first thing you need to do in a presentation is, uh, after you attract the attention of your audience, is you describe for them why they need to listen. Okay. Again, what's in it for me? What's in it for me with them? And then after you state the, the need, you start to give them the solution. You give, and this is the body of your presentation. Your presentation is the solution. What are the essential elements that should be present in an informed consent? What is, how do I do a risk benefit analysis? What are the levels of review? Then you, you, you sort of go through the core of your presentation. And as you do that, you are making it explicit that you're answering the, the questions of the need. You're telling the, the people that uh, you have problems with writing informed consent. Here is how you write an informed consent. You have not done risk and benefit assessment. Here is how you do a risk benefit assessment. Okay, so you present, you you create the question in their mind by the need, by uh, describing the problem, and then you solve this question for them. And that is how you keep the attention flowing of your audience. Now, usually, what we, we do with all of these, these are really uh, intuitive things. You present the problem, and then you present it, just like when we're doing presentations about. Uh, topics in medicine. You present the burden of the disease, the pathogenesis, how it happens, and then the treatment. So it's sort of logical. What we usually fail to do in presentations is the last two steps, visualization and action. What we need to do is, uh, is have people take this knowledge outside of this session room. We want what we say in the session room to remain. We want, it, uh, to, we want audience to retain this and take it outside of the session room. And how do we do that? We want to have them visualize what the results will look like, okay? So we want, you want to say sentences in your presentation about, for example, uh, how good it will feel next time when you write an informed consent for a, a research proposal. And uh, how good it will feel uh, the next time you give a presentation and you follow the Monroe motivated sequence, okay? Uh, and finally, you end by the action. And this is the most important step. People usually at the end of the presentation need to be given what I should do next. What is the next step? Okay, this is when you give people, for example, uh, like the Professor Henry said, some homework or an action, something to do. So I am now motivated, okay, because this sequence has motivated me. It had me visualize what it will look like when I utilize the learnings from this presentation. Now I need to know what is the first step afterwards. What is the first step? So I need to go home and, for example, try to write an informed consent for a research proposal. A research proposal. I will go home and then, uh, 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 for example, research more on something. Uh, I will uh, go home and read something, give people something to read, give them something to do. Okay? And this sometimes is missing in our presentations, giving people something to do at the end of the presentation. So we need to end with an action. Okay. You have people motivated throughout your presentation. What you need to give them at the end is some action. What do we need to do? They need to have something to do. Because some people get very motivated and when you miss this part uh, of action, they do nothing. Okay. For example, the Meriti program is about changing the culture in our organizations about research ethics, for example. It's about uh, spreading the knowledge and the skills of, of, uh, uh, of research ethics in our organizations. So part of, of, uh, of you uh, being uh, involved in this training is to build your skill set in, in, in also change management, in, uh, uh, in teaching uh, research ethics. And then after you finish this program, you will, need to be, uh, uh, you will need to have assignments on what to do next, okay? Because you need to know all of this knowledge, what am I going to do with it? So you give a presentation, people will say, this is excellent. What am I going to do with it? And that is something you need to tell uh, the audience. What you will do with it is you go home and you do one, two, three. This is, will be part of your take home message or your finale. Okay, does this make sense? Any questions? No. no. So what I use uh, when I prepare a presentation is I first prepare it as I, as I always have been preparing it without, uh, uh, before I knew the Monroe motivated sequence. And then I bring up the sequence and I match my presentation to the sequence. 
Sometimes I will uh, adjust the, the order of some slides. I will find myself missing parts of the Monroe motivated sequence. So I add slides about uh, visualization or I add the slide about the solutions. And so it's, it's sort of a, a map that you can use while you are building your presentation so that you don't miss anything. Okay? It, it helps you keep your audience motivated and it also uh, helps you deliver what you uh, deliver the core of the content of your presentation to your audience. Okay. So, um, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you're bringing up those last two steps. Um, uh, now, the Moretti program is supposed to um, hopefully make you all change agents, you know, to change, I don't want to say, well, to change the, the culture of, of research and ethics review, that type of culture for sure. I, I want you to be the, um, oh, uh, what word am I searching for? The um, uh, ambassadors for research ethics. And it, it would be interesting uh, to think about what the result will look like. Well, better protection for research participants. Uh, what's the immediate action? Uh, take a better informed consent form from, from, from potential participants. Um, Having said that, uh, what about if you give a lecture that's purely informational? You give the, the most recent update about um, how to treat COVID patients or, or what's, what's happening with the, um, um, a vaccine, blah, blah, blah. It, it's just, you, you're giving a an update, right, on a state of the art. Pick, pick your medical specialty. So, uh, I, what do you do with that in terms of um, immediate action? Um, go to the library and study more, read up more about it, or uh, is there? I mean, uh, the Monroe motivated sequence. I'm just, I mean, I, I, I love that whole concept, but um, there are some talks you give to motivate people to do something, to be change agents, okay? Um, you know, just like the TED Talks, you know, um, be a better person, blah, 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 you know? But what about those purely academic? Um, I guess, I guess it really, it, what do you think, Maha? It depends on the subject matter, the, the intention. That, yes, I would say, for example, that if it's a, a purely knowledge-based presentation, uh, yeah, we, we can brainstorm actions, but it would be something like, like you said, follow our website, uh, uh, download the application and follow the news. But, but there will be nothing that is like directly related to, to the content of a presentation, I think. Right, yeah, so, um, so I'm just, um, I'm trying to um, think back uh, when I had that person come in to talk about the Monroe motivated sequence and, um, uh, and he did a good job, but I'm just thinking that a lot of his um, presentations that he gives um, um, is, is the business people mm -hmm. and and he comes in and motivate business people to you know take on a different way of seeing things doing things planning blah 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 uh, uh, but having said that I mean for sure this program is meant to um, uh, make changes and and so it uh, and I'm I'm guilty of this myself that um, 
it would be good to uh, 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 see see how each presentation could be developed um, to um, uh, to be linked with a uh, with a change in action, uh, and so let's uh, let's why don't we all. Um, um, uh, think about that uh, with with all the presentations you'll hear um, in the next few weeks. Um, having said that, um, I I will say that um, uh, I uh, years ago I realized that um, I, I wanted to um, uh, enhance the presentation skills of individuals in this program. Um, and, and I was motivated by that. One time there was, um, we put on this full day workshop at the, um, one, one of the research institutes in Cairo, the Nas um, National Research Center. I can't remember the exact name. And so I, I had all the trainees, you know, give their talks, blah, 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 the whole day, I remember. It was a hot day. Well, that's not surprising, but anyway. Um, and I remember, I remember this person specifically. It was like three o'clock in the afternoon, and we're just all tired from just hearing lecture after lecture after lecture. And this, this young guy stood up, and he, and he said the usual, things that you hear. He said, you know, this conference, this workshop has been wonderful. Yeah, right. And um, uh, very interesting lectures, blah, blah, blah. And, and then he said, you know, it's like a quarter after three, and I still don't know how to write an informed consent form. Uh, and so he was looking for some kind of change, immediate action. And, 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 and I'm listening to him and I said, you know, you, uh, you're right. I mean, I didn't tell him this, but I said to myself, he, he's correct. There's no one's gonna go home and ha do something differently because of this workshop. Uh, and so it, it just brings up the point that people want some information um, uh, in order to, to make a change in what they're doing. So that's a, a very, I just want to emphasize that point. So let's, um, let's see uh, what kind of changes where uh, uh, each, each learning point Will will instill us to to do. Okay, good, great, good. I also may suggest something about uh, cultural change. Uh, if uh, we we used to do a discussion forum about um, what people would like to to act as agents of change in what would what change they would like to see in their organizations in in relation to research ethics. Maybe towards the end of the of the two weeks or the three weeks, we can do something like that. A, a Right, I know which uh, forum you're talking about. Um, it's a, uh, it's about the um, right, the um, um, uh, enabling conditions yes. for for research ethics and what changes would one um, want to make in their organization, or or also um, when, well, I was going to say. Uh, it used to be when I had people come to the U.S. What what kind of changes when you go back? Obviously, you're not going back. You're you're there already. But what kind of changes would you want to make in your organization to enhance research ethics? And in fact, uh, yeah, why don't we um, start thinking about that? What um, what kind of changes. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, why don't we have um, a discussion forum on that? What kind of changes would you like to see um, happen 
in your organization. Um, and um, trust me, I, uh, um, I, 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 I used to, I used to say, but I, I've toned down a little bit. But I, I used to, uh, I, I don't want to make you all activists uh, and and get you all in trouble. Um, but um, it's it's kind of like, well, um, how how could you make change in your organization? So thanks for bringing that up. Okay, good, good idea, great action. Yes, okay. It's like action research. Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay. All right. Good. So, any questions so far? No. Okay. So now we are preparing for the finale. What do you think we should do at the end of a, of a presentation? What do you usually do? And summarize the presentation and give take home message. Okay. Yes, we, we have this, uh, uh, when you're uh, giving a presentation to adults, if it lasts like more than 15 to 20 minutes, you are probably going to lose their attention at some point during the presentation. But once you say, and this is my final slide, everyone sort of wakes up and, and starts to stretch and then not wake up the people beside them who have been sleeping during the presentation. So the first thing you need to do is to tell people that you're going to end. So you cite the end, you tell people, and the last thought I'm going to be discussing today is so-and-so, or this is my final take-home message. And, as, and, and you utilize the increase in the attention of people at the end of the presentation because they are becoming more alert now, you know, they're going home or, or that they are finally going to, to leave this presentation. And you utilize the attention by summarizing what you have said giving people action, telling them, telling them what you need them to do uh, as a response to this presentation. And as I said, I believe you should always end strong. Keep something very profound for the end of your presentation. End by something profound. By a quote, for example, maybe. Uh, by a story, by a, a metaphor, uh, 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 or maybe a, a question. Choose anything of the attention hooks with your and end Okay, because people tend to take the impression about the presentation as a whole from how it ended. Okay, the, the, the worst thing you do when giving a presentation is waiting until the slideshow ends and, and, and the, the screen comes black and, and it writes up at the top end of presentation, end of slideshow, and then people didn't know that you were ending. Okay, you have wasted a, a precious moment, the moment where you cite the end, people's attention start to rise. Now you have your, their attention because uh, they know that uh, the, th this is the end of the presentation. This is when you give a summary because sometimes people miss parts of your presentation. Give them the action, what you want them to do, and then end strong, end by something profound, okay? Afterwards, you can have a question and answer session or, or uh, you still have time in, in your presentation. Now, I would like to discuss with you two training aids or, or aids in, in presentation. The first one is, is metaphors and analogies, because I, I've noticed that we, we, when we think of research ethics, we don't really use much of, of, uh, of uh, a lot of stories. We use case studies, of course, which is, could be a type of metaphors, but during a presentation, it is always a good idea to, uh, to um, prepare one or two metaphors during your presentation. So what a metaphor is, it's uh, a statement or a story that characterizes one thing in terms of another, okay? So it's, it's an analogy, it's a story, but it also has a learning point. So whenever you start telling a story, people become interested, because people like uh, visualization. So if you're giving a, a really a, a monotonous presentation and then you start saying, uh, a few years ago, when I was still a resident, you will find people starting to pay attention. Yes, 
I can visualize that. I can visualize this person being a lot younger and then say that you had an interaction with a patient who did not uh, understand the informed consent or whatever. And, and you put this metaphor in the context of, of, uh, of your presentation. So it has a learning point. Okay? The learning point is something that we call the aha moment. So you start telling the, the metaphor. I, 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 a few years ago, I was very young. I was talking to a, a person who was uh, a, a candidate to join a research project and uh, um, she was uh, illiterate and I was her treating physician. So when I said, would you like, to, I explained the study and I said, would you like to join the study? And she said, whatever you say, doctor, for example. And this is the aha moment, okay? It's when I reach the point, the highest point in the metaphor where people start to understand where I'm going with this metaphor. So now I'm saying uh, this process has not been effective because now the patient is not giving a response of, of, uh, of consent, of, of, a, of a consent to join or, or is not displaying evidence that she has understood the process of, of being a research participant, okay? And whenever you engage in a metaphor, uh, first you need to, to put it inside the context of your presentation, and then you need to, with your, uh, uh, with your, uh, the, your gestures of your hand and with your body, you need to, uh, uh, to help people visualize this, uh, this metaphor. And this also has the advantage, like questions of having people not looking directly at you, but they are looking in the back of their minds and creating the images that you're, uh, that, that you're telling them in, in the metaphor, okay? So put, put in some metaphors in your presentations, even if it's a purely clinical uh, presentation like uh, uh, what was Professor Henry uh, suggesting. You're giving people a presentation about a disease, you're discussing the pathogenesis or uh, the um, uh, clinical picture or whatever, it is always nice to give people metaphors, living examples of, of what it looks like, of, of what people feel when they do that or do this, okay? And you, you speak to people, for example, about how, how this learning, the thing that you are discussing have changed people in the past. And people like hearing live stories. People like uh, uh, to visualize in their minds what happens to other people in, in, in the same context as they are. So that is why it is useful, very useful, for you to prepare metaphors and embed them in your presentation as you, as you go in your presentation. It, it's, a, it's a wonderful attention hook. It takes the attention of yourself. If you're self-conscious and, and you don't like people really looking at you during a presentation, it takes their minds and their eyes into their heads, imagining whatever you're uh, describing. Uh, and it also uh, has a profound effect on, on, on learning points. It, it, it sort of grounds whatever knowledge you're saying into the uh, uh, experience of a into the experience of, of your audience. Okay. Also, one important training aid is your is your visual aids. Uh, do you, uh, do you have experience with using uh, anything other than PowerPoint as visual aids? Has anyone used anything different from PowerPoint? Uh, yes, we we used as part of our PowerPoint, uh, we used a hyperlink to a YouTube video to make sure that they understand the scientific and medical terms because mm -hmm. most of our audience were like lawyers and law students. So they were not really uh, understanding the context. So we thought it's better to put a very short like a clip Mm -hmm. explaining the medical terms and showing things so it was very very helpful excellent so multimedia it, it, it could also save us a lot of time you know just mm -hmm. explaining all those just with five minutes video they could understand everything yes this is actually uh, excellent using multimedia because uh, uh, moving images are, are more uh, engaging than still images. So videos are usually a wonderful way of, of engaging people. And it, 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 it does save time because a video is made as short as possible. And maybe as you want to say something, it takes a lot longer time. So it's nice to show videos. What else have you used other than a PowerPoint? So oh, uh, I haven't used it myself, but I, I have attended before a presentation with uh, Prezi. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with it. Yeah, but, but I found it confusing to some extent. 
like having so much multimedia and they are moving. So I start to, um, to concentrate with the movement rather than the information. Okay. So it got caught up in the packaging and then the content got away. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay. Well, I've seen uh, very professional presentations using Prezi. Uh, but as you said, some people really overdo it. Uh, what about a flip chart and a pen? Have any of you uh, uh, used only a flip chart without a presentation? Uh, like in teaching? In giving any presentations, yes, in teaching or whatever. Uh, I think it's hard in, in conferences, but it could be like a teaching method. Okay. So uh, I'm saying this because some people really get caught up on, on, on using PowerPoint. And a PowerPoint presentation uh, gives you advantages, but it also takes away some of them. Okay. Uh, you can use animations and stuff, but uh, uh, when you want to do relationships or when you want to, the audience to give you feedback or, or to participate in the, in the process of uh, of, of an exercise or in, inside an exercise, it's very difficult to do it without uh, uh, um, um, a flip chart and a marker, okay? So the PowerPoint is, is usually presets. You can't make changes on spot. So it's some, some, sometimes it's limiting, okay? So what I would suggest if in the context of, of teaching, not in, in conference presentations or so, uh, if you have the opportunity to have a flip chart and a pen or a whiteboard and a pen, uh, it would be very nice because also you can use that for some of the active learning techniques we'll be discussing in a, in a minute. So uh, sometimes, as I said, PowerPoint has advantages. It's a, it's a, a, a wonderful visual tool, but it, it can also be limiting, okay, because it, you have to, it's a preset sequence of things that will appear on the screen, okay? What if you want the audience to participate in, in whatever, in this learning process? then you can use a flip chart, okay? That, so, that... Um, two things. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, a flip chart works in a workshop of like 25, 30 people, okay? Mm -hmm. Because people obviously could um, still see it. Um, um, also, Maha, you could, um, you could put up a a whiteboard. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you know how to do that? On, on go, top? go to or... share screen and yes. pick the whiteboard option. Yes. Yes. On, on right. Zoom. Yeah, on the Zoom. Well, uh, go, go ahead and do it. There you go. Right. So, the whiteboard or the flip chart is good, let's say, uh, if you want to interact with the audience and, and ask them, okay, um, what are your thoughts about this quote or about this movie segment? And then you could uh, uh, write down what every, everyone is saying, okay? So that, that is an engaging activity where you take a break from the PowerPoint, okay? And uh, now you're interacting with the audience, you're writing down what they're saying, they're looking at what the heck they, they were just saying, and that um, motivates more thinking. Um, and so, so actually, you could use a whiteboard uh, in a larger presentation room um, with um, now, oh, I guess, um, well, even in PowerPoint, actually, it's, it's a lot easier with Zoom. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, you could bring up a, a blank slide in PowerPoint, uh, uh, but depending on what type of PowerPoint you have, um, it, it could work or it could not work. But um, that's why sometimes I like presenting from the iPad, because the iPad, you could make things a lot bigger, like what I was doing before when I was sharing my screen, and I wanted to pinpoint 
uh, uh, something on the slide, so I just made it bigger so that everyone could see. So there are different tools uh, you could use uh, in order to uh, uh, have variations in the in the presentation. Um, I I agree with you with Pressy. Uh, I mean that's a a good animation type of tool, but I don't know. Personally, I just get too dizzy. You know, world. I feel like I'm going around the world in 80 days. But anyway, good. So good, good use of the uh, whiteboard. Okay, very good. Uh, so and and also remember in in terms of visual aids the most important visual aid What is it? What is the most important visual aid? A photo No, not the photo body language Exactly. You are the most important visual aid you can prepare an excellent presentation But if you're giving your back to the audience and reading of the PowerPoint then then nothing happens Okay, you want people to engage with you. You want the audience to engage, uh, to interact with you, not with your PowerPoint. Okay, so it is a visual aid as in it helps the main visual uh, item of a presentation, which is you. Okay, so you have to keep that in mind. So what are things you can involve in your presentation? Uh, let's talk about small groups, uh, uh, presentations that you can, uh, Enhance active learning. Have you used any tools for uh, enhancing active learning in, in your presentations? Let's say you're giving a workshop or a presentation in a workshop for 25 to 30 people. Uh, you have 45 minutes. You give a short presentation and then you want people to, to start practicing. How do you get people to engage and practice? What, what, what do you use so far? Uh, well, I can actually start with a trailer of a movie. Okay. With a uh, what? A trailer of a movie. I'm sorry? A movie trailer? Uh, uh, oh, a movie trailer. Yeah. I see. Okay. And, and uh, give them the flashcards so, uh, and they have questions after that about the movie and ask them question and do brainstorming in the beginning so they get really engaged with me. Okay, so the movie has, has, has relevance to the, to the learning point? Yeah. Okay, that's a good idea if you can find a movie, Total. Your, your, your learning point. Yeah, sometimes when we're teaching genetics, it's a little bit harder for the student to understand a lot of things about genetic engineering. Mm -hmm. and cloning and stem cells and stuff like that so when they have a movie about something like that or like bioinformatics or a sequencing a virus or something like that it's really caught their attention and the uh, actually by the end of the lecture i can give them another movie to watch and we can discuss discuss it in the beginning of the other the beginning of the next presentation so they are really um, anxious to see what they're gonna see in the movie and they keep asking me about the link and the YouTube and stuff like that so yes yeah, so, so so the action is for them to watch a movie that's a that's a very good homework I mean I think a very welcome homework okay uh, thank you Dr. Sasson what else you can use to engage the audience have them uh, participate in the process of learning can you use the uh, click cards? I'm sorry, say that again? Clickers or clickering systems. Yes. So it's sort of like the application, have them answer questions or what is it? Yeah, yeah, I can give them like questions or multiple choices and they can use their mobile phones to answer. So polling, yes. Okay. Yes, polling, yeah. That's also one of the active learning techniques also. What else? I think uh, it's also useful to have like moving people around and uh, dividing them into groups and ask them to give them a, an activity relevant to the uh, lecture and then asking them to present it or rate it 
uh, in their own group and how well they uh, performed. Yes, excellent. It's always a good idea to have people move around because uh, if you're sitting for too long, you get you usually get bored and your level of energy sort of, you know, moves down. And as people move, the idea also of active learning is that you want people to learn not only from whoever is presenting, but also from each other. Because in, in adult learning, people already come with experiences. You usually don't start from people with people from scratch. You start with people with experiences and you need them to learn from each other just as they learn from the presenters. So yes, discussion, discussion in, in small groups will, will have people brainstorm ideas or, or, uh, or solutions and, and have them debate about, uh, for example, controversial points. Uh, one also uh, um, very nice learning, uh, active learning technique is, is called the, the gallery walk. Is anyone familiar with the gallery walk? Yes. So, so basically what you do is, is if you have a, a training room, you uh, put up on the walls flip chart papers, okay? Uh, have each group discuss any topic and then write down whatever they have discussed or the results of discussion on, on the, on the uh, flip chart. And then have each group move around the hall as if walking in a gallery to see what other groups have discussed and, and how similar they are to their thoughts and how different they are to their thoughts, okay? So for example, you ask people to discuss um, barriers to effective, uh, to, to change management, for example, barriers to, uh, um, uh, or, or for example, ideas about uh, changes in, in your organization that relate to research ethics or how to be an effective presenter or effective communication skills, anything that, that people have an input in. As an adult, you will always have an input in things like that. Have people discuss that, write down some points on a flip chart, and then have every group move around the hall and see what other groups have done. Okay, so this is what we call a gallery walk. Uh, yes, uh, the, the result we get was very, very interesting because uh, it helped people to, um, you know, uh, to, to be more energized and looking forward to go back to their seat and uh, listen, you know, attentively and very, you know, looking forward to what, what, what will happen next instead mm -hmm. of just sitting to the end of the lecture and then, okay, that's, that's all, you can go home, you know? One exercise I, I usually do sometimes uh, when I give uh, monitoring and evaluation um, uh, workshops is that I give people uh, flashcards with uh, activities that relate to monitoring, activities that relate to evaluation. And on each of the small groups, I have them uh, divide the, the, uh, these uh, uh, flashcards. I want them to decide which of these uh, uh, activities relate more to monitoring, which relate more to uh, evaluation and after they do that I have them to take a, a also a tour on other tables see how other people have divided them and then they start to debate no we, we, we thought this was a monitoring uh, uh, skill why do you put it in evaluation and then afterwards after they have seen what every group has done we sit back down we go back to our seats and and they are really motivated to know uh, the right answer or, or how does this exercise conclude so it's, yes, I agree with you. It's a very good idea to have people move around, uh, but be sure to put enough time for that, okay? Because it takes time. You are trying to build a critical thinking exercise or an exercise that for people to brainstorm and people need time to do that. You don't, you, you can't give them 10 minutes, for example, to, to write up things. And if, if you really want them to dig deeper in themselves and, and do the exercise correctly, you need to allow enough time for them to do that. And, and, and it's time well spent, okay? If you, if you can keep your presentation as short as possible and have them do exercises uh, and give enough time for them to do exercises, you are actually ensuring some active learning, whether from each other or, or as the whole group comes back and then discusses the ideas. Yeah, and of course it's not applicable everywhere. It's just, it requires enough room in that, you know, enough space to move around and yes. Exactly. That's, that's why it's... Um... This is the first time for me. Go ahead, Dr. Sousan. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, this is my... I was always doing the flip chart thing, but I never knew that it's called the gallery walk. 
I usually the flip charts I was I was I would bring them in different colors. So I have the color red, group color red and other things. But the most interesting thing about that is I learn from them more than I expected. Like if I'm asking them, for example, to state what they, they think, uh, what's in the universal declaration of human rights, and they start writing stuff and I start explaining to them what this stuff mean in, in, term, in terms, in uh, human rights terms. I actually learn from them a lot of things more than I teach them. I don't know. Does this make sense? Yes, yes, it does make sense. I think a, a learning experience is a learning experience for everyone. If, if, if uh, I have learned a lot of things uh, from people that have, have, have uh, who are my audience. And it's, uh, it's always a learning experience because, uh, as I said, when you're uh, engaging with adults, there is always something that they can bring to the table. It's not only you who knows everything and who, who, who is a subject matter expert. Sometimes uh, people can teach you a lot of things. And, and, and I'm glad you're, you, you, you realize that and you're open to, to, to making this a learning experience. Okay, uh, Professor Henry. I was gonna say in response to what Golana said, that's why it's important when you're giving a presentation uh, to, to know ahead of time what venue you'll be presenting in. So you will know your space limitations. Um, and it's always a good idea to um, ask about the room and um, visit the room an hour before you're going to give your presentation so you, you get familiar uh, with, the, with the whole setup. Um, yes. So you, you have time to think about it. Good. Um, so what else in terms of uh, uh, active learning techniques? We have the think, pair, share uh, activity. It's when you give uh, the participants or the audience something to uh, think about, maybe a, a case study or a problem, and then have them think about it to themselves and then have them discuss it with the person sitting next to them. So they are pairing and then discussing them in the, in the smaller group or in, in the larger group, okay? So here you're, you're asking people to, again, use their evaluation skills or, uh, uh, or their critical thinking. Uh, also whole group discussions like we have been doing usually during these trainings when, uh, as you give the presentation, during your presentation, you ask people questions and they, uh, uh, they give uh, their opinions. Also whole group discussions can be done after case studies. Uh, a case study is mainly a, uh, a metaphor, okay? It's a case, so it's a, a living example of, of whatever skill you're trying to have them acquire. You have them think about it. You can use a case study, then think pair share, a case study, and then a whole group discussion, a case study, and then a quiz. So it's, it's, uh, it's actually uh, very useful, and it's also uh, very useful in the teaching of research ethics, okay? It brings context, case studies like metaphors, it brings context to the abstract terms, to the abstract knowledge, it, it puts it into action. Okay, so you can discuss, for example, plagiarism and authorship and give the people the guidelines and, and all of the things, but it will only be rooted in, in as, as part of their knowledge when you give them a case study and have them discuss who, who has right and uh, who, who's, who's right and who's wrong, who's correct and who's incorrect in, in a case study. Like Dr. Said said, polling, uh, individual and, and group quizzes, um, sorting strips is, is sort of like uh, what I was uh, giving you an example of when you uh, have categories and you want people to decide uh, if items should go in a specific category or another category. So for example, in, in, in responsible conduct of research, we have plagiarism, we have falsification, we have fabrication. Okay, so I can give people some strips with, with mini case studies and I want each group to decide whether this case study falls under falsification or fabrication or plagiarism. So I'm, I'm, I'm having them think of the definition of each of the three big categories and I'm having them decide or sort or classify uh, uh, some words or some uh, uh, case studies according to, uh, uh, to these categories, okay? So you, you give each group uh, the categories, you give them strips with uh, 
case studies and have them then sort them according uh, to, to each classification. Okay, there are, I would say hundreds of ways of, of, do, of engaging your audience in learning, of having them being part of the learning process. Okay? And, and this is maybe the, the most important part of your preparing, is preparing how you are going to engage your audience to, to make them become part of the learning process. Okay, so uh, I know this might sound, yes, uh, also the poster and gallery walk here, what else? Yes, debates, you can have your participants debate things. You can give them, uh, classify them into two groups and give them also a case study and have them take different positions uh, in the case study and have them prepare a debate, prepare an argument uh, to defend their, uh, uh, their, their standpoint and they would respond to each other uh, like that. Again, everything takes a lot of time. So you need to allocate time. You need also to, to make sure that you have the space to do that. In a in a in a session room. Okay. Can I see something too? Yes, please. Hello. Can you yes. Hear me? Yeah. Uh, there is something in directed learning called role play. Yes. So maybe the, with the students or with the audience, you can do the role play, and it's really actually encouraging them to search more and try to get into into the case that you're studying. And it's uh, in the same time, it's fun. So you don't get bored or get distracted by anything else than your presentation. Exactly. As we said, if, if when things uh, become more playful, people are more uh, interested in the learning process. So like using things with colors, having them move around, having them use different colors to, to, uh, in, in writing and uh, uh, engaging their creative part of their mind. As you do that, you engage the audience more and more in the learning process. Um, so this was all about your planning. So I know it, it sounded very long, <laughs> but this is because yes, the planning process should be uh, very long. If, if you're planning a, a half an hour presentation, I believe this should take like two or three days. Uh, and and it's, it, it's usually that the longer, the shorter your presentation is, the longer you need to plan because you need to uh, condense whatever you want to, uh, your, your take home message within a smaller amount of time. So in the delivery of your presentation, you need to work on your own skills as a presenter, okay? So we, every presentation is, is one third verbal, one third vocal and, and one third visual. So what we mean by verbal is, is whatever you are going to say. Vocal is your tone of voice, okay? How you uh, vary your tone of voice so that you, uh, uh, don't get people bored and, and wanting to sleep. And visual is how you move in within the space, how you move as a, as a visual image to your participants, how you move and how uh, you move your hands and what your gestures are as you give the presentation. So these are a few things that you, you might need to, uh, to consider when you're giving a presentation. A good way of, of, uh, uh, of um, of mastering these skills is doing a rehearsal, okay? So if you have a presentation in a conference or, uh, or in a workshop, it's always a good thing to rehearse. If you could record to yourself, record a, a video of yourself and then watch it, you will have a, an evaluation of how, you, uh, uh, how you're doing in terms of these skills. So this list is a, is a very short list. It's, it, it's actually, there are many other skills uh, but this is sort of a checklist when you're watching yourself to give a presentation. If you video yourself and you watch yourself as you give a presentation, this is a checklist to, that you need to have in order to say uh, how much you, how, how good you have been in, in terms of the voice tone, of the eye contact, of the hand gestures, of your body motion, and of your spatial marks. So the voice tone is, uh, is how you vary your, uh, uh, the speed and the tone of your voice according to whatever you're saying. Okay. So when you need to make emphasis, uh, sometimes you need to uh, lower your voice a little bit and slow your voice if you're making emphasis. This is also very important when you're giving uh, metaphors or when you're telling metaphors and you're speaking about something that is, for example, emotional, then you need to lower the tone of your voice. Uh, uh, you, it, it, it does not only relate to, uh, uh, to the volume of your voice, 
but also to uh, how much uh, uh, pressure you put on each word as you speak. Okay? So uh, it's like being an actor, actually. Being a presenter is very much like being an actor or, or a singer. So it, whatever you're saying verbally can have a very profound meaning if you say it in the right tone of voice and can have a very, a totally different meaning if you say it in a different tone of voice. Okay? So, and this is something that comes with practice. So you, you evaluate yourself as a presenter, you find the weak points and the strength points because you, the strength points is, is, is the thing that you will rely on in a presentation. And then there is always room for, for improvement. You practice, you listen to presentation of others, you see how they change the tone of voice, and then you try it yourself. And, and you, with the process, you will learn uh, to improve any of these skills. One important aspect also is having uh, eye contact with your participants. Uh, so, uh, as I said, whenever you have friends or colleagues in the audience, you will find yourself unconsciously uh, looking at them more than you're looking at the other audience. Also, if you find uh, one of the audience who you think represents a threat to you, for example, if an audience is sitting like that and looking at you like that, you will find yourself evading looking at them. And, and you should resist that. Okay? Sometimes people uh, have the uh, sometimes this is how they understand. By sitting this way, this is how they, uh, this is their understanding uh, posture. So don't make judgments about who is interested in the presentation and who is not, okay? Because this is going to confuse you and it's going to make you a, a little bit more tense. Uh, try to be very, uh, try to, uh, to equally uh, uh, look at everyone in the audience, not through the whole presentation. Uh, try not to be leaning more towards one part of the of the audience instead of another. If you think a group of the audience is, is, is interacting with you and answering your questions, you need to, to have them tone down so that they can let other people uh, have a voice because some people are really shy by nature and, and they, they would require you to be extra friendly with them in order for them to, to speak up. So you need to balance uh, how many of the audience get to speak and, and you need to give uh, time for other people who are not really willing to speak. You need to give them a chance or, or an, a motivation uh, to speak. And, and you do that sometimes with, with your eye contact or sometimes with, uh, with the gestures of your hand. Okay? Yes, I, I will do damage control later, so no problem. So uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the eye contact, um, uh, uh, I would... Um, I, especially in the beginning, I pur purposefully, there's a phrase, scan the audience, mm -hmm. where you're purposefully scanning the whole audience, okay? Mm -hmm. And, and within, within, five, within five minutes, uh, I know, or five, ten minutes, I know which people are interested in my presentation, okay, and 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 the people who are not interested in my presentation, that is totally fine with me, okay. And after five or ten minutes, I know which people are interested in my presentation, so I keep on going back to them, okay, because they're my friends, right? When when you go to a uh, a party or something like that, right? You you gravitate towards the people you want to talk with, right? So in my presentation, I gravitate towards the people who I think are interested in my presentation because I get a lot of energy from that. Okay, um, uh, people um, interested in my presentation, and when I make eye contact, I you know, try to make eye contact with people um, to the point where it's almost, almost uncomfortable for them with me looking at them, okay? So I'm not uncomfortable with people looking at me. I look at them, okay? And, and, and they hopefully get energy from me, okay? Um, hopefully they're also listening, but anyway, that's another story. So yes, eye contact, very, very important. Very important, yes. 
Okay. Um, other aspects of your uh, visual presentation is how you move your hands and how you move around in the space that you have. So uh, some people really feel comfortable just uh, standing in the, in the middle of the room without moving around that much. That is okay, if, but you can still use the space you have with your hands. And this is what we call the spatial marks. So for example, if I'm uh, giving a presentation about uh, uh, informed consent, I could say, the first thing we'll be discussing, and I, I make this mark on the ground, this is this, is, this unconscious mark just with my hands, we'll be discussing the um, uh, why we give an informed, con why we take an informed consent, then I will be discussing the process, and then we will be discussing, for example, challenges. And then even as I stand here, whenever I'm referring to something that relates to the why, I will put my hands this way. If I'm talking about things that relate to the process, then it's right in front of me. And then when I'm discussing challenges, it's, it's on my right. This is what we call the spatial marks. So it's, it's a good way to use the space that you have. People sometimes are, are, are very comfortable moving around the space and, and, and going, also making marks with, with the stories they tell, with the metaphors, uh, with, with parts of the presentation, dividing the presentations into parts, or even you can have that in the space, in the, like the vertical space. So you can you will first be discussing this and then that and then that. And whenever you refer to something, you use the same spatial mark. The, you, you refer to the same space that you used in the first place to discuss that. This sort of organizes the visual, uh, the visual memory of, of the participants. You know, when, when you're in a classroom and, 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 the, and the teacher writes something on the board this, uh, in this part, and then even after it's erased, you can still remember that, yes, I remember that this piece of information was written in, in this part of the screen or on this part of the, uh, uh, of the whiteboard. And that is sometimes how our mind tends to organize, to organize information. Okay? So you, you also video yourself, watch the video, and give yourself a rating on, on how well you move in the space that you have, how well you, you make marks, on, on, on different parts of your presentation, uh, how well you uh, scan, for example, the audience, how well you give eye contact, how much time do you spend giving eye contact to each participant. And then as you rate yourself, uh, you can, there is always room for improvement. You start to improve yourself. And this is your evaluation. When you evaluate yourself, think of these uh, few points. Evaluate your learning point. Has, has, has your learning point been clear enough? Have you, uh, in the summary, stated exactly what you want people to go home with? Your organization and your flow, your body language and your visual aid, okay? And it's, it's an excellent idea. I know that, that some people think it's, it's too much. I, um, why would I video myself? I know how I did, no, but watching it as someone else, you will find yourself uh, giving yourself honest feedback, okay? You will be very uh, annoyed by your voice, usually. <laughs> your first impression is that uh, you would think, uh, my God, I, don't, I didn't know I sounded like that. Uh, but then you will start to notice. You will be, you will be critical of, of, of how you stand, how you move around. And then uh, this is where you decide, yes, these are my weak points. But uh, my advice is to also notice what you're good at. Okay, because this is what you rely on in your presentation. If I know, for example, that I'm really not good at moving around, but I have a strong voice. Okay, so this is what I lean on. You lean on, you work on your weakness points, but what you lean on in a presentation, what you know is going to, to support you in your presentation is your strength points. Okay, so you, you make note of, of both of them, your performance. What was not very good, but also what was excellent, because this is what you lean on in a presentation. Okay, so I have... Uh, two extra slides where I discuss do's and don'ts. So this is the action of, of this presentation skills uh, uh, presentation. Uh, but up to this point, are there any questions? Comments? Yeah, actually, I have one. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, about the, the spatial marks. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, when I do it, I get caught up in it. So. Uh, I had some feedback saying that that might distract my audience. So I don't know how the audience. Like my my hand gesture when I'm moving around or I'm, I'm moving uh, around. Like I like to move around the students when I'm teaching them something. I try to get engaged with them. So I leave the stage and I go I go down down to 
them in the um, in the classroom so i'm using my hand a lot so some of them said that when i'm using my hand a lot or moving a lot that's distract them from what i'm saying and instead of me just standing still and speaking well it uh, it all depends on what you mean by moving your hands if you if you're going like that that's going to distract okay if you just go like that or like this whatever you know uh in a non the distracting way uh, uh, I I think that's good uh, uh, so uh, the same thing with moving around uh, uh, you should on one hand move around but you don't want to keep on going back and forth from one end of the stage to the other um, having said that I would always advise not to stand behind the podium, unless you're giving a talk to 300 people, okay? But the podium serves as a barrier between you and the audience. So, uh, um, so I, I try not to uh, stand behind the podium, and that's why I always ask for a mic that could go on my shirt or, or my suit jacket so, I, so that I could move around rather than be tethered to the mic at the um, podium. So yes, Sarsen, keep on moving your hands. Okay. We, yeah, I, we I look have a forward problem. to that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, I am teaching for uh, like 500 students. 500. So I leave the stage and keep, yeah, 500 plus actually. Like I had uh, one plus like 570 students. And I want all of them to be engaged with me, so I don't lose uh, I don't lose them in the process of teaching them. So I leave the stage and I keep moving really around, really from back. To well, I don't know what you forth. mean by really around, but uh, 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 now um, actually, uh, you may you may even uh, uh, think about joining your audience. Okay. Getting off the stage totally, right? Uh, yeah, I actually sit with them. Like I sit in the middle of them and I start asking them questions. You could spare me the details about sitting with them, but that's that's probably okay too. Okay, good. Yes, excellent. Keep on moving around. Um, so good, good point. Uh, other. Other thoughts? So, I want to ask a question. Yes? Uh, yeah, it's about uh, the language. So, if uh, I'm sure that the audience all are Arabic speaking. So, can I talk both in Arabic and English, or it's like some sort of unprofessional behavior? I mean, sometimes people are not concentrating when the whole talk is in English. And then when you try to engage them by asking a question in Arabic language or something, they become more concentrating or focusing. Well, that what do you think? Know your audience. Uh, so usually they, they don't agree on one point. So uh, because this happened with me before, so one time I tried to talk both uh, in, in medical terms, we talk in English, but I usually like prefer to speak in Arabic, uh, explaining or asking questions. And then one of the comments that uh, it's more professional to talk in English only. So I just want to know your opinion. Now your audience. <laughs> I think uh, some 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 conferences uh, said the language. Uh, it's about the context of the uh, conference or meeting or whatever uh, you're joining. Uh, some conference state that the the, the language uh, uh, the presentation should be in English. So I think it's 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 about the context uh, and the audience. Well, you know, um, obviously, if you're speaking at a large conference in which uh, not everyone speaks Arabic, 
then yeah this would go without saying to speak in english right yeah so mm -hmm. uh, uh, if it's in your university uh again know your audience uh you know many times um uh when people give presentations at a workshop that i'm giving uh they ask me oh could i explain some terms in arabic and i said well that's this is your audience not me you know i i trust that you will say the right thing so you know use use the um arabic um, also because there are just some english terms that that begs for arabic translation uh so uh, so again know your topic know your audience there are no hard rules for every presentation okay um so um so next Wednesday, according to the agenda, unless I change it again, uh, uh, you will be giving your presentations. So, uh, Maha, would you like to leave them with some actions? Yes. Yes. So let's finish with uh, a few do's and don'ts. So uh, start with an attention hook. Uh, sometimes you can use numbers, statistics to reflect relevance, give examples and stories. Uh, the lighthouse effect is what I refer to when you're, when you're doing the, 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 the eye contact, okay? So you move like a lighthouse from the far side of the, to the left to the far side of the, uh, to the right, so that you can make sure that you have looked at every one of the participants that you had given eye contact to every one of the participants. This is called the lighthouse effect as it sort of rotates, you're not, rotating mechanically, of course, but you're keeping in mind that there are people that are sitting at the periphery of, of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the whole room, and you also need to give them some eye contact. Use different tools and senses in presentation. Senses we mean as in, 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 in the vision, the hearing, the touching, uh, speaking, have them engage more than one sense, okay? Do not give a, a full presentation, you are speaking and, and they are just listening. So. Try to engage as many senses as you can of, of your audience. Again, as we said, ask smart questions. Know why you're asking questions, okay? Questions are an excellent tool if you use them wisely. Are you asking them to generate discussions uh, to reflect the relevance to the topic you, are, you will be discussing uh, to regain their attention, okay? So it, within your, your, your pocket of, of, of skills or your, or your bag of skills, have a lot of questions, prepare a lot of questions. So whenever you get stuck in a presentation, whenever you feel that people are, are losing attention or, or whatever, you can grab one of these tools, whatever it is, a question or a metaphor, and, and aim with it and, and, and target the audience and see if it works or not. If it works, well and good. If it doesn't work, go back to your skill set and, and, and choose another tool and so on, okay? So the point is to have a, a rich skill set so you can manage the presentation with a lot of resources. The don'ts. Don't hide behind the barrier, like a podium, for example, like Professor Henry was just saying. It, it, uh, it sort of uh, gives you an, a sense of being protected from the audience, but the audience cannot see you. So they find it difficult to connect with the person standing behind the barrier, okay? Don't stick to the desk. If you have the, the, your computer on a desk in, 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 a, in the session room, don't stand right next to the computer, okay? Try to get a picker or a presenter to share the slides for you so that you can move around. Okay? So don't, do this. Uh, don't go deeply into definitions and theories, okay? Uh, what we, what, usually, people are not interested very much in, 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 knowledge in a presentation, okay? It's something that they can read at home before they come to give a reading exercise before they come. We go very deep into uh, definitions. Um, usually, I, I would be very, uh, I, I would rate a presentation by what the presenter starts with, okay? So if a presenter starts, for example, in a conference where we are all, for example, rheumatologists, and it's a conference for rheumatology, and if he starts by a definition of rheumatoid arthritis, I would know that they will be wasting some of my time discussing things that I already know. 
Okay. So I know it's the classical thing to do is to start with the definition, but you should know your audience. Everyone sitting around this room knows exactly what this is. You don't have to restate the obvious. Okay. Don't spoon feed or give knowledge by kilos. Okay. Don't uh, say everything in a presentation. In, in adult learning, we say less is more. Okay, leave something for the audience to go back and, and, and find out for themselves. Leave something for them to teach each other during the exercises. And don't give your audience uh, your back to read from the wall or from, from your presentation. Okay, because as I said, the presentation is a visual aid, but it's, it's aiding you in giving an effective presentation. So whenever you give your back to the presentation, you lose their attention. Like there is this invisible rope between you and the audience as you speak with them and as you address them and as you make eye contact. Whenever you move away from the audience and give them your back, these ropes are, are immediately cut and you have to, uh, to go back and, and rebuild these ropes again. Okay, so when you are reading from the, the presentation, you can send beside the, the, the screen like this. Okay? So you, you have not your back to the audience, but your side to the audience. And then you can move your hand like this, you, so sort of you have the attention and read and you look back at the audience. Of course, you know what's written on the presentation, so you don't read everything off the presentation. It's only when you forget, for example, the next point or something that you look at the presentation, you read it, or you can even ask one of the participants to read it, so you don't give the audience your back. Okay? So uh, try uh, to keep eye contact with your audience at all times. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Excellent. We haven't clapped hands for the speakers yet. Hi, guys. All right. Oh, gosh. Uh,